Five, four, three, two. Well, hello, hello, and welcome back. Welcome to everybody here. Thanks for coming out to Utah Node.js. Thank you very much, Vivint, uh, uh, proxied by Jeff for providing the space and the food. Uh, I'm AJ. I run the meetup. I, uh, I'm, a, I'm a Crockfordian JavaScripter, which is a very special type of JavaScripter. And I'm going to be presenting tonight on classless JavaScript. And um, we're, this is going to be interesting because in order to know what classless is, you kind of need to understand classes and some of the paradigms. My slides are, uh, as, uh, as per usual, out of order and probably not complete, but it's okay because we'll go to code examples and live coding always works wonderfully, as we know. So we'll have a good time. We'll have a good discussion, and that's going to be um, hopefully the, the best part of it. So uh, let's see. Classless JavaScript. Can we get it to go to the next slide? Yeah? Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, otherwise known as JavaScript is the good Crockford intended. Here, here. So I don't know if this is actually a TLDR anymore because I expanded and then expanded and then it uh -huh. might have, I think, I think that it evol evolved into the whole presentation. But okay, this is, this is a method of doing classless JavaScript. Uh, this is this is a way of organizing code that, that we could consider classless. There's a couple of different definitions of classless that you could take, but I'll just uh, I'll briefly go over this because we're going to pick it apart in a, in a minute. But you have some sort of package or module, however you want to call it. It's called node modules. Uh, we often refer to them as libraries or packages or modules, whatever. But that you have something that is the package, you've got a function that creates stuff and that returns stuff that it creates. Oh, it's Spence. Spence, come on around. Come on around. <laughs> Spencer must have been the ghost that was that was uh, knocking outside. Yep. All right. So... Uh, I'm just too classy to respond to it, uh, to, to the you can't copy anything. That was a long time ago, man, responding to the chat. Uh, and then we have uh, a, a potential m method here. So anyway, I just does this code make sense in of itself? You get a gist of what's going on here. So my understanding here is up here, um, well, a person that credit card it, it basically uh, it basically set to this anonymous function. Well, it's what? it's not that anonymous, but yes. In the sense, it doesn't have a name. Well, it does have a name, but we'll 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 dig into the very specifics. It's like a method. But yeah, it's it's that's what it's doing. It's great method. Yeah. All right. So it it's still it's still a kind of a classy ish pattern. Okay, so. Um, Alan Kay has, has declared himself to be the person who made up the term object-oriented, and he says that C++ is not what he had in mind. And so when we talk about classes, we, we, object-oriented programming is, is a really loaded term, but people tend to think about it in terms of Java and C++ and things like that. And that is, according to Alan Kay, who claims to be the person who coined the term object-oriented, is not a good example of what... Um, what he meant by object-oriented programming. The, the type of hierarchy class systems that have evolved are not, um, not, not up to his standard. Um, and JavaScript, this is okay because JavaScript actually doesn't have classes, or at least it didn't until they started taking parts of TypeScript, and, which is actually just a, 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 a basically a, a, a C-sharp uh, script, if you will, and, and started getting that ratified into the JavaScript standard. So, but but JavaScript doesn't have classes. And the reason I say that, well, let, and we'll we'll see we'll see how how I get to this. I'm going to try to follow the slides. But JavaScript had prototypes, and the thing that I don't think I actually put on the slide is prototypes. What does the word prototype mean? Like just in English, what does the word prototype mean? 
an early version, version. Yeah. of something <laughs> like, let's say, you have an invention, the earliest version of the invention, like the draft, is the prototype. It's not the finished product. Yes. So what do you think, from the name, prototypes might have been intended for? That might be asking a little bit too broad of a question. But JavaScript was implemented in, it, well, it, was, it, was, it was designed in 10 days and put into a web browser where it was going to get shipped out and obviously there was going to be things in the language that needed to change. And so JavaScript prototypes are actually, there's, there's this whole uh, appropriation thing that, that happened where the term prototype got appropriated to mean class, which is not what it's intended for. And then we had to come up with this new term for what prototypes actually are, and it's called polyfills. So if you ever heard the term polyfill, that's what prototypes are for. They are for they are for backporting features into the language that are ratified in standards before browser manufacturers can update to release them. IE loves them from Yeah, uh, well, anyway. And so a question that I have is, why would you even want to do classes in JavaScript in the first place? So the benefits of JavaScript are that it is to get the representation of information to a string across a network and back. So this is really, really awesome. Uh, it's duct typed, so you can just add a property onto an object in JavaScript. You can check if it has that property. If it has that property, then you can tell that it's the thing that you need to do this with. And hopefully you've done this in your code somewhere where you have an if you know, object.thing do this, else if object.other thing do that. So that's that's duct typing. And uh, it is, it's dynamic, ty dynamic type. Uh, JavaScript has closures. This is something that's super powerful. Uh, that's a whole nother presentation unto itself, but closures give us the ability to create scope. And especially if you consider when JavaScript came about in the 90s, uh, languages were still not very good with scoping. Uh, maybe, yeah, in general, we, we didn't. So in JavaScript, you, you, you scope meaning where a variable lives. And C, there are two scopes. There is the global scope, and there is a single function scope, and that's it. With JavaScript and Rust and Golang, you can have any number of levels of scope. And so you can, you don't have to create factories in, in Java and C++. You have to create all these, these factories and things to contain scope. So you can put scope in an object and you can pass that object around. And then, so you have to, for everything that you want to have scope, you, you have to have some sort of structure to hold it. Whereas in modern languages, JavaScript, Go, Rust, you have closures, which means that you can just create a variable somewhere create a function, and that function can have, or Lambda, if it's Rust, uh, can have access to that. And then, then, then also JavaScript is async. And the awesome thing about JavaScript being async is that this means that it can be really efficient. So if you, well, not that it can't, it's not necessarily as efficient as the threaded model, but it can be really efficient in a naive way. So you don't have to worry about data races. No one, well, there is still a possibility for a type of data race in JavaScript, but, but essentially uh, you don't think when you're writing JavaScript code, oh, what happens if two requests come in at the same time? Uh, will my program uh, explode and crash because I tried to write, uh, I tried to increment a, a counter of number of online users by one. Um, the asynchrony of JavaScript means that every function executes until its completion and then something else can happen. But every time a function runs, the function runs until its completion. So you are guaranteed that a function can't be in the middle of running and then some other function be running and modify values that are reflected in this function. Now, there's some exception to that with async await because async await creates a syntax sugar that does allow you to create promises without actually seeing the function scope that you're creating. But when you do async await, you're creating new scopes. You just don't really know. Anyway, so these are all benefits of JavaScript. Like I said, pretty much the same as Go and Rust. And uh, yeah, so we're talking about serializable. Like I said, we can hydrate, dehydrate objects across the network as JSON. 
And this is this is very nice. We we like that we can take uh, this. We call this a plain value object. You can put it over an API in a database, etc. Duct type. We talked about this. I probably should have gone through these slides instead of explaining them all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then uh, closures. Really great use case for closure is when you have a secret, something like an API key that you don't want to exist in an object that's accessible. Closures are how you have true private members of a of a of a object of some sort. Is uh, so right here. I say create API request key in secret, and then I return a function that is a request function that wraps a request object, and the request object has access to the API key and the API secret. But it, but uh, I, if you were to take that function and call to string on it or console dot log it, there's no way that you could that the function that's returned from this, you wouldn't be able to get back what the key and secret are. So they're stored in a safe, private place. If you JSON not stringify it, those aren't revealed. Um, and then async, this is kind of a great example. Promise.all is, it, it provides a good example. Multiple things can happen at the same time and they, they each operate within their own scope. So these are benefits of JavaScript just in general. So the detriment of classes is that uh, you've got a lot of awkward states. So all sorts of people have these strategies for how to deal with thisness problems in JavaScript. And if you've used other languages, Java, C++, et cetera, you get thisness problems, right? And the, the whole idea of just dealing with a this object is, well, it's kind of confusing because this doesn't mean anything. It's difficult to talk about. It's difficult to reason about. And then there's just there's just these little bugs that that pop up that are obnoxious. Inheritance is just a really silly idea. Of uh, I have a shape class, and all things of a shape class have an area function. And wait, is a circle is that a child of a square or is that a child of a shape? Uh, you know, things just really quickly things fall apart if you're trying to draw a line as if it's a a genetic ancestral chart to go from, you know, from from this class down here to this class up here. Inheritance is just generally a mess. It's it's uh, difficult to deal with. And uh, yeah, in in general, classes just create lots of complexity. They create lots of overhead. Um, they're just clunky. So if we want to, but but the the what, what people say that you know that why do you why do you need a class? It's typically for some, uh, you need to create a new thing and the thing needs to have some data and some capabilities. So you need a new person, the person needs to have a name, they need to have an age, and they need to have the ability to greet someone else and to uh, pay with a credit card, you know, something like that. So uh, what? just throw out, out here because I'm not really sure what you know, level of, of expertise I'm, I'm speaking to or, or backgrounds. What are the reasons that you in the past may have reached for a class or do you not reach for classes? Angular. Hmm? When you use Angular. But this is a weird question. Oh, it's okay, but you don't... Why would you need a class in Angular? Because it's like... I didn't... What I mean is, what's the goal you're trying to accomplish if you if you create a class? Honestly, something? I couldn't figure it out in Angular why we needed classes because... Like, I thought it was a mistake to do that whole thing because it's like so complicated. It seemed overcomplicated. Overcomplicated. Okay. Like it, but, I, but I'm sure there was a reason. I don't know what it was. Well, the, generally the idea is that you want to create a new something, like a new person, and then you want, right. you want some capabilities on there. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to demonstrate this here in the simplest way possible. It totally makes sense to have a person package, and the person package would have functions in it that relate to things that you want to do with a person, such as creating a person. So you might want to instantiate a person and have a constructor, and the constructor will say, if you give me some values, I'll use those values, otherwise I'll use default values, right? And so what we have here is I have some number of values that I'm gonna pass in as P, these are just options, arbitrary options. And I'm going to copy those over into a person object. But if they don't exist, then I'm going to um, populate them with this. So in this case, the name is 
another Jane Doe and the age is zero, right? But this, this, is, this is a constructor. This is a factory. This is a person factory. But this is it done really, really simply. Um, are, is there anything that's, uh, any, any questions you have about this or anything that's confusing about this or that defies expectation? Hey, for God, what's up? Here to learn JavaScript. Awesome. Please uh, comment with questions as you have them. Uh, no coalescing, I think, is a new feature that I don't know about yet. Would it also work if instead of declaring the var person, you just return that object, or would that cause a problem? Uh, so, you, yeah, you could do that, but you'll see that dot, dot, dot right there? Yeah. So there's more code, and we're going to need access to the person. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. All right. So what is what is no coalescing, though? Because that's something I'm not familiar with. Uh, it's, just, it's just two question marks. Um, the nice thing about it is basically... Does it actually work yet? <laughs> you, you, have to, you have to call up the internet and get it approved on your device. No, I don't know. It's like you have to, you have to make sure you're using the latest... It, sh it should be in the latest. Do it in the console. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring this over. Do it in the console. I think it'll work. Yeah, because here's, here's a rule that I have. If it doesn't work, it's not JavaScript. I've used it before. It works. JavaScript is moving so fast. But it doesn't really. It doesn't really move that fast. People make up fake stuff, and then they tell you that it's real because they want you to buy into it. That, I was on Node 17. Or no, yeah, okay, Node 16. So let's say I've got so, var so, okay, x. Okay, so make var x. Okay, it's undefined, right? Yeah. So, and then say it's equal to zero. I want it just equal to zero like this? Or no, no, sorry. So oh, crap. instead go x equals undefined x, yeah, e or x equals undefined. X is undefined. I know. Just, and then undefined and then space and then two question marks. And then do like zero. And then x is zero. Because it, it's what it does is it 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 doesn't bleep out your like it doesn't freak out when x is undefined. If you do or and it's undefined, ah, sometimes there's an yes. issue. Yes. And so that's why null coalescing is yeah. It's a, okay, so if this is null, what happens? Does it retain the null value? Okay, got it. So if it's undefined or null then that's the only, so this, this is the falsy problem in JavaScript. Yeah. So zero yeah. is falsy, empty string is falsy. So, so, if, yeah. well, so if I said this because, to... Because true equals one, you know, tr true double equals one. I mean, stuff like that, you know, like that's... Yeah, okay, so this is awesome. Since it actually exists and it's in the language, <laughs> I, uh, I will start using it. Not in the browser, but in Node. Because I don't use stuff in the browser until it's been in browsers for a year or two. Well, no, it's, it works in the console of the browser. Yeah, well, in Chrome, but what about, you know, all the other browsers? Like mobile Safari and Firefox and, you know, I'm being realistic Internet here. Explorer. <laughs> Not Internet Explorer. You know, I, 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 had a, I was on Upwork and I did a job for a guy and he wanted it work, did, he wanted some video thing working right in, in Safari and I spent way too much time trying to figure that out. Like, it was... The documentation for Safari was very difficult. And, yeah. I don't know. Um, I'm trying to find the Wi-Fi here. Uh, Vivint guest? Yeah. Okay. All right, cool. Unfortunately, we make devices with wireless access points, so if you're on the wrong floor, there's like 100 <laughs> SSIDs. You have to scroll past to find it. It can be pretty rough. So I'm going to check out if this is in Node LTS, because typically my, my thing is... It right, don't, if it's in 14... Yeah, if it's in 14, then I'm totally totally for it. Uh, var x equals uh, null. Yep, okay, I'm in. I'm using it. Thank you. I learned something tonight. This meetup was worth it for me. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm AJ O'Neill, and I approve of this null coalescing. I'm, I'm glad I'm to teach you something. Hey, you're using that head on your shoulders for something good. Okay.
So uh, that was kind of uh, unrelated to this other than that. Cool. Yeah, what I could have done here was put double question marks, and I, I approve of that. Uh, the problem is I use it too often now when I shouldn't probably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's nice. So false, if false is a defined value, null coalescing will not affect false. Yeah, Whereas if you had, if, if age was false or age was zero, then it would assign. So that's why this is good. Anyway. One, one more thing real quick. You also, when you're chaining methods, say you were chaining three layers deep, like p name dot first name or something. Yeah. You can, you know, the question, you can put the question mark after p, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, so that one, yeah, I saw that they had added that. I didn't realize that they had already added the null coalescing as but well. That, I've heard about then it. then it doesn't freak out at you when, you, yeah. So. That's even yeah. faster than the ternary. That's really cool. Uh, don't speak of ternaries in, in my classroom. <laughs> Yeah. You will be exiled. <laughs> no. So the, the thing is, well, that's that's the thing is, it, I, and there's, well, I'm not going to go into it because it's, but let's put a pin in this. Somebody write this down to for me to give an example of where ternaries and the double bars here can go bad. Like seriously, write it down, make a note. I'll come back around to it at the end. Okay, make it make a note. Okay, let's let's move on. So. This is an example of a factory, a, a, a person factory. It's just a create function. We have, we have uh, module.exports might as well be an empty object. In fact, it is an empty object. And person.create is just a person factory. So we want a person to be able to do things. Now, one of the benefits of JavaScript objects is being serializable. We can put them over a network. You cannot put a function over a network. A function exists in memory. It exists in an application. I cannot write a function to a file and have it have an, an effective meaning, uh, you know, that on my computer, on your computer, on the server. A function is a verb. It's an action. We can store nouns. We can serialize nouns. We can't serialize functions. So what I prefer to do much of the time is I will do this right here. So this, we would consider this to be a static method if we're talking about classes, but I just take my person module and I add a function greet to it, and then I will pass in P as person. And then we've got other here as well. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass in P here, and we avoid thisness. You don't need any this. You know what the context is because you pass in the context. The context is P, but you, you get it. It's intuitive, it's easy to understand. This is also uh, easy to test as well. I don't, I, I, don't have to, I don't have to use a constructor necessarily. If I only need two properties from person to be able to test how this works, or in this case, I only need one property from person, I just need to know name. So I can pass in an object that just has name. I don't have to instantiate a full person. I don't, the person doesn't have to pass validation, and I can just pass it in and I can I could test this function and I could see do I get the right value back. So when you write this, it's person dot greet and then uh, you just put in the person and the other person's name or the other person object. Yeah. So there's two people object going objects going in. That's all you're doing. Yeah. yeah. That's it. But typically, what I'll do is whatever whatever the letter is of the of the module that I'm defining. So if my module's person or my module's payments or my module's posts. Everything begins with P, that's not intentional. Uh, or my model is comments. So I'll just put C or P or B or whatever is the first letter, and that will be my this. But when you go and look at the code, you know, if I was to grep through code for this dot name, holy moly, think of all the code I'm gonna see. But if I grep through code for B dot name, I'm only gonna get the things that are actually whatever that B represents, uh, you know, maybe a blog post or, right? And so this is, this is better for readability as a human. I can understand the context of it better. And it's, uh, I'm not conflating my, my, I think this is called a, I don't remember if this is called von Neumann architecture. There's, there's two architecture styles. One is data and functions go together and the other is data and functions are separate. So this is the. Like Harvard's is separate. Harvard's. Was, uh, together. Yeah. 
So that, that this is also just a philosophy of let's keep our functions separate from our data, which uh, databases are this way. Uh, you know, code. There's a place for functions to be embedded in code and in databases, but you know. Okay, and somebody said no, but I don't know what they said no to. So sorry. <laughs> I have a question. Yes, so questions. You're saying person A is this person dot group, or no? So let's go back. See, module module dot exports is person. So capital P person. Always always use capital letter for your package. Right. In in the Node ecosystem, it's fifty fifty. Half of the packages use a capital letter, and then half of them don't, and it's kind of eh. But I do everything capital letter if it's a module. If it's a function, lowercase. If it's a if it's an item of data or an instance, lowercase. But if it is a module or a package or a class or some sort of collection of code stuff, I always start it with a capital letter. What, what I'm saying is, when you implement this person.greet, are you, you already have a person, you already have a person created and you're greeting them, you're just introducing just one argument, just the other person, not two arguments. No, that, this is just a function that takes two person objects. Yeah, it's a function it that takes two, per it's two okay. person objects, so it is. For a second I thought it was, it was like, yeah. We'll see that, and we'll, we'll see the other way in just a moment. Okay, cool. But anyway, I think that this is good. Um, but I, you know, I would, I wouldn't. So you could do a. So this is the static method approach. This is the member method approach. So the member method approach. I should have put this in context. But if we go back to where the dot dot dots are, see that dot dot dot. Yes. Okay, that's where this is inserted. So that's that's part of what's in the dot 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 is here's a person dot greet. So here I'm attaching the function to the person. Now, if I JSON dot stringify that person, this is the problem. If I JSON dot parse that person, they're not a whole person object because they don't have a greet method. Now I could take this person object ostensibly, depending on the implementation and pass it into create. And then I could get a person that is rehydrated. So a person that has all of its values and all of its properties or methods, all of its functionality. But uh, the thing I don't like about this, like I said, is it taints the objects. It's, it's too much like classes. Now, now, now I have to know more about the data. Now it's not serializable. Now I have to have more ceremony uh, around it. And there are cases where that's important, but I would argue that the majority of the time you don't. If you're dealing with a credit card, that is a case where you do not want to use a JSON object because you do not want it going out in your logs. And I have an example of that uh, later. Okay, so here's a realistic static method, something that I think uh, a save method is, is a really you know, common thing that you're going to have for any type of object you want a way to save it. So I've got my person, package, I have a save method, it's an async method. Here's the other thing. Classes in the C++ and Java sense, they do not work well if you have um, async code. Because async code means that things can happen at any time. And classes are based around the idea that the state of the object can always be known. So at any time, I can call get name, and I'm going to get back what the person's name is. And unless I do some sort of interaction, such as call set name, I can expect that person's name to be the same. But the moment that uh, you have async code, if you call get name, and then you call get name again, you don't have a guarantee that the two get names are going to give you the same result because in between the time that you call get name, you might have called set name. So let's say this scenario. Let's say that, that we have an async set function that's going to go update the server first, right? So we have, we have a, a person.set name and I call person.set name. It sets their name. It goes to the server and I call get name. What am I going to get when I call when I call get name? I might get the old value or I might get the new value. It's not known. So this is not a good model for classes because you have to look inside the code to determine how things are handled. If you just handle things as objects, you know, modify the object, object's updated. Save the object, the object is saving, but whatever the object state is, was is the state that the object was at at the time that you hit save. So, I mean, there's arguments for all different ways, but I think this is just a, a, a this is a good paradigm. Um, so, anyway, does this, uh, any question about, about this 
I, I think this makes sense. It's pretty clear. Nothing fancy there. Okay. And then here's a realistic member method. This, this is where I would say, um, oh yeah, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm showing the whole thing. Good. So this is the credit card example. If you collect a credit card from a user, say you have an input form or something like that, you do not want a credit card to be JSON. For one, you are legally not allowed to store in any form the, uh, the three-digit code that's on the back of the credit card. You're not allowed to save that in your database. You're not allowed to put it in logs. You're not allowed to have it in a, a spreadsheet. It is, it is for transactional purposes only. You can take it and keep it in memory as long as the transaction is processing. And when that's done, and it's typically just for verification. So the first time they use the card, you use that. You don't have to use it every, every time. Uh, but typically that's, but you're, you're not allowed to save that. And so if you're accepting credit card information, no matter where you're accepting it, you don't want that information to leak. So we might say, okay, I'm going to take this P object that's got a credit card on it and I'm going to assign it to null. And the reason I'm doing this is because it, for issues of security, as soon as I know that, that something has been transferred, something that's sensitive, such as an API key or a credit card has been transferred from a place where I don't know what's happening with it and someone might use it incorrectly to a place where it's in the proper place, I want to zero it out, right? So if this was in a request stack for say Express or something, as soon as the credit card information is handled, if the user were to accidentally log it, I don't want it to show up in their logs if they're using my my person library for handling credit cards, right? Okay, so, and then we can have a credit card function that gets, you know, we've we've got a scope now for CC and that dot, 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 I, this code actually goes in the middle there. So, um, so, so sorry that they're, they're in two separate places, but where the dot, dot, dot is, that's where this code gets inserted. And so now we have a credit card function that we're gonna pass it true if we need to get out the actual credit card or we're not gonna pass it anything and we'll get back a bunch of stars in the last four digits. So this is how we could we could do our credit card. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, okay, that just that slide was just weird. Transition was off. Anyway, so this is the kind of thing that we can do if we want truly private member data. Um, and you don't get this with the, the pseudo classes that JavaScript offers. It doesn't have a way to do private methods. But using, using closures, you can have, you can have uh, private data in a method. Now, I will, I will say right now, there's a downside to this. Computers these days only have 16 gigabytes of RAM. And you're adding an additional pointer to your application when you use this style of member method. But the good news is processors only ship with four cores and 3.8 gigahertz. So rather than going in a lookup table to have to get to a method that belongs to a class, this can execute the method directly on the object so it's faster. So you just kind of have to choose. If you're concerned about only having 16 gigs of RAM, you don't want to use this method because you'll have to give up a whole pointer. That could be, what, eight bytes? Uh, and if you go the other method, then, you know, you got to be cautious because it might slow your program down. Um, I'm being facetious, of course, because computers are so fast these days that back, back in the day, you'll hear C++ people talk about void virtual pointers and virtual tables and stuff like this. Back in the day when we had countable megahertz processors, if you had a lot of virtual lookups in classical inheritance chains, like JavaScript prototypes, for example, say you inherit the method speak from human, and there's human, and then there's employee, and then there's a manager, which is also an employee, and then there's a, um, uh, a director, which is also a manager, and if you want the director to speak, it has it doesn't have a speak method, so it has to go to the manager and look in the manager class. And the manager class doesn't have a speak method, so it has to go up into the employee class. And that doesn't have a speak method, so it has to go up into the, the person class. And that doesn't have a speak method, so it has to go up in the human class. And then it finds the speak method, so it has to it has to traverse a tree of inheritance to get its method. And, and that's how 
how uh, when people do classes in JavaScript, it works the same way. Whatever in your inheritance is, you save on memory because you don't have a direct pointer to the method on the object, but then you lose out on speed because it has to traverse the hierarchy to get to the method. Yes? So I'm confused by the first line, the let cc equal p credit card. When you create a person, um, why would you have anything in the credit card? In P credit card, does P is it passing in a person? So passing in a person that has a credit card, or well, so the, 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 maybe this oh, could I have. See, I see what you're okay. This yeah. this is the idea with the create function is that this could work in a couple of different scenarios. So it could work if you're creating an entirely new person from whole cloth, right? So if you only have a name and you want to instantiate the person, then this is a method to do it. But also if you need to rehydrate a person, you got a person across the network and right. you need to rehydrate them, this is the way that you could do it as well. And I missed the first part, so sorry. Yeah, and if you were rehydrating the person and you gave them back across the network these stars as their credit card number, then you wouldn't be able to expose the credit card, but it would still show the last four, I guess. But, you know, it, everything's contrived for the sake of being able to put an example through. Okay, so, oh, I did, I did actually have some slides about this. Yeah, so we talked about this at the beginning. Reappropriation. Um, is, that, is that the term that kids are using these days for when you steal something from one, one uh, classic, classification and apply it to another without respect to its, its historical significance? I think that's just appropriation. Okay. Yeah, anyway. So, like I was saying before, a prototype is not a class. It wasn't intended as a class. Prototype, as the name would dictate, was intended that you can add what we now call polyfills is what prototypes were intended for, that you could add features to the language without having to have a new browser shipped to you. So that if... You know, just as we've done, if you know there's a new version of JavaScript coming out and it doesn't completely break the language in every way from the syntax, but it's just adding to the standard library, you could adjust the prototype of the array method, for example. So when for each came out and map and all, find and, and um, includes and all those different methods that are now part of arrays, before they were there, you could have them simply by including an ES7.js in a script tag, and it could polyfill all of the missing features. That's what prototypes are for. That is their, their intent. They are, not, they are not classes. They weren't pretending to be classes, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, so that's that. That's all I had there. Um, yeah, so that was, uh, that, that's, that then there's the slides. So what I want to do next is I want to take a look at two things that are fairly equivalent. Uh, compromise passwords. Excellent. I love that. <laughs> so I created a library called uh, PayPal. And as you might guess, it is for interacting with a little known API called the PayPal API. And indeed it is little known uh, because it is very difficult to understand. Uh, let's see. Oh, PayPal checkout. That's what I call it. At root PayPal checkout. Okay, so uh, AWS is absolutely terrible. One of the reasons that classes are great, that people like classes, is that classes make it so that you can write some XML in a diagram tool and then have it auto-generate code in every single language. So that's one of the things people like about classes. If you've ever used any of the AWS code, it doesn't matter which language you use. It's all the same terrible code because it's just auto-generated. So instead of Go code that looks, smells, feels, tastes like Go code, it's Go code that looks, smells, tastes like C++. And everything in the AWS library, it's all auto-generated documentation, auto-generated code. Microsoft has done this a bunch. So... One of the things that, that is nice about classes is that you can write a class once in an abstract language and then have it um, filled out into lots of other languages for you without uh, as much human intervention. So do I even link to the official PayPal checkout here? I need to pull that one up first because I need you to see how convoluted and difficult to understand it is. PayPal checkout 
SDK. Basically, reading the SDK documentation was worse than implementing it from the curl commands, which I actually find that to be the case quite often. Um, I'm going to look for, I think it's called PayPal Checkout SDK. I don't think it's server. Checkout SDK for Node. Okay, maybe this is it. Let's see. So this is class-based code. Let me see if I can bring this up here. And it's tripping me out because there's a half second latency or so between my finger moving and the <laughs> mouse moving on the screen. So that's... So is Elon Musk like in this repo? Probably. How do, how do we know? How can we find out? Well, he made PayPal. He coded it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, then he's here, definitely. Okay. So just take just take a look at this. This is typical classical inheritance code. We've got a PayPal and a core, and we, we create an environment. This is just to create state. That's what this is. This is a constructor in order to essentially create variables, right? And then the environment is going to get passed to a PayPal HTTP client constructor. So now we've got a PayPal client. Great. Now we can create a new PayPal orders uh, orders create request, and then we can. Then now that we have a, a request factory, now we can create a body with the JSON. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna cheat. I'm just gonna tell you, you know what this does? It 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 turns what you passed in into an object. Like all of this ceremony is just to save request.body. It just takes it, it just request.body and it puts that on there. And there's a couple of other things depending if you if you set some values. There's certain options that are available across multiple of their, their requests, and it will it will just copy that value onto this object for you. So it's the same as doing a request.body.x equals y, essentially. Um, okay, so create an order. Same thing here. Oh, and then we have client.execute, you know? So this, I, this is, if it's not auto-generated code, it's code that was written by somebody who is... Uh, you, predominantly their day job is writing in Java or C-sharp, a, a classical language. Um, okay. So it, it just, it just, it makes it feel like there's a lot going on here. You know, when you see all of these factories and all these constructors and, you know, it just, it just feels like, wow, this must be a really advanced API. What are you laughing at? Well, this is very true. The, especially about AWS. Yeah. It's like it's like you can tell like that they like overthought it or something. Or like it was just like it is not by somebody that like you said predominantly does like node. Like when I'm using the node libraries, it's like no, like it was made for they're using like snake case and or they're using like Yeah, they're using like the wrong case you never use and all kinds of stuff. So I'm going to go in here into their, their library, uh, and it just requires other things. So we've got lots of layers of indirection here. This is good. This is good. We want to make sure that every function has its own file. Yes. Yes. Because when we look through the code to understand what's going on, oh, there we are. Yeah, that's it. That's the one. Okay. So we and, and every folder needs, of course, I don't know why they didn't call it index.js, probably because, again, they're not no developers that created this. They're... C sharp or Java developers, okay, and then you know it, it's. See, look, look at this. This class was generated, <laughs> right? And you'll see that in lots of SDKs from big enterprise companies. Okay, and look, look at this. So it's got it's got this whole class, and then it's got a constructor, and it's this. You know, what is this doing? What is this actually doing? It's just creating an object, like I did with that person. Var p equals da 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 da. Except it's got all these thises in there. You know, OK, so now I, I've got no useful information in here. This is the other thing is the, the, the information is is kept far apart rather than grouping everything together. Say these like things go together. We got just you have to go through every single file to figure out what's going on because there's no documentation. If you noticed in the readme, there was no documentation. Right. And if you go to the documentation, the documentation is auto generated. So it's very generic and it doesn't it just tells you how the PayPal API works in general. But it, it doesn't give you, there's no specific examples for how to use 
the node version of the API because you're just supposed to, well, I think there are a few, but it, it's just difficult to understand. Okay, that, didn't I just look at that one? I don't even know what's going on there. Is it, for PayPal, isn't it just like they just say, like, just tell us how much it is and where it's going? And oh, no, it's it's much more complex than that. We, we can... Because that, that whenever I do a PayPal transaction on, like, for a service, it's always like, okay, we'll redirect you to PayPal now. And then yes, but they have to set up a payment intent, and there's, I if you'd like to watch the 30-hour video series, I live coded while I implemented the PayPal API. Now, granted, the first five hours were just me trying to figure out how to do anything, because I, big, the, PayPal's been around a long time. They have lots of different versions of their API. They've acquired different companies to build their API. And so when you go looking for the right. PayPal documentation, it's one of those things where if you're an enterprise business partner, you've had a handshake from somebody in your company and their company and they're onboarding you. If you're just coming out as a, a random dude trying to search for their documentation, good luck finding the right stuff that's the up-to-date current thing that you need. I mean, you said the top of this from their Braintree SDK, which is one of their uh, acquisitions, yeah. Of, yeah. Of the Braintree SDK generator yeah and in the paypal api in some places it says um don't use this method anymore go use the brain tree api with the brain tree documentation and then take that object and then use that object and you know so yeah it's got a lot of that going on but yeah that, that happens it's as a company grows but this is just it's really difficult I, I don't know for me this is just super difficult to understand if you're from a c-sharp background then you probably read this no problem but i just don't even know what this is saying like I, these just seem so disconnected and unrelated that I, I just, I don't know what this is, what this is doing. And, and look, here, here's that request body that we saw. Literally, this dot body equals, it does nothing. It doesn't touch the object at all. It's just an abstraction for abstraction's sake. But this is the kind of thing that when you learn about classes that they teach you to do. They teach you to abstract everything, have getters and setters and yada, yada, yada. I think we'll go maybe one more layer deep and then we'll move on because um, I, I want to show you what, what I created and uh, you know let you compare and contrast for yourself whether you think it's uh, easier to understand or not. I mean, I, I feel like this gives me fond memories of Enterprise FizzBuzz, which... Yeah, that's, that's essentially what it is. I mean... It just, every single function has got a different factory for it. it, it you know, every, it, just all of this could be in one file, and you'll see, because I put it all in one file. I think I put it in two files, actually. But okay, we're, we're done looking at this. Now we're going to go back, because it, it, was, it was just more difficult to figure out even where the source code was to see which options were being passed in than it was to just, when I finally found the curl examples, I was very happy, because the curl examples are actually pretty good. Um, and they're very simple. You know, when you just see curl, oh, I need to set this header and I need to pass in this object. Oh, even better. If you look at the way that GitHub Actions works. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take, take one brief detour. And this won't take too long at all. I promise. I think. So this is uh, one of my, my technical blogs. It's only high quality technical stuff. How GitHub does smarter shallow clones. See this right here? Make it a little bigger. Oh, yeah, let's make it bigger. Two megabytes of TypeScript for the code that generates this in GitHub Actions. Two megabytes of TypeScript. Because of all the classes and the inheritances and the instantiation. All it needs to do is run a couple of git commands, pass some options, and then bring in some variables from your from your uh, GitHub, not secrets, but the environment variables that they inject when you run a GitHub action. This is what happens when you start a repo? No, this is what happens when you run any GitHub action. These are the first commands that run. And they have two megabytes of JavaScript that generates these lines. A TypeScript. Did I say JavaScript? I meant TypeScript, not JavaScript. Okay, you mean by JavaScript or by GitHub Action? As like, like what would be an example? I'm not going to go into that right now. Okay. But it's it's their CI CD platform. Oh. Okay. They've had it for about a year, maybe. And you know what to do with thing when you push code. Oh, yeah. oh, oh, yeah, okay. All right. Capital A actions. Okay, so. Right. The action. Yeah. 
here's, here's some classless JavaScript for you. So I got PPC, PayPal checkout, PayPal checkout, init. Now, granted, this is, this is kind of a no-no because this is saying we're going to have one global PayPal checkout object that you're initializing. So you can't have two instances of a PayPal checkout object. So this might be better if I had a ppc.create. Um, but for my purposes here, this is, this is what I did. Um, and it's going to work for 99999999999% of people of the two people that ever use this other than me, if that. Um, okay, here's creating an order. All right, now I do have some scoping to this, request, And this to me kind of makes sense because there's lots of different types of requests that we could create. We could create an order, we could create a product, we could create a user. And so I do have some sub scoping there, but there it is. That's it. You know, those are the things you pass in. No, no thisness, no factories, just plain, simple, classless JavaScript. Just static methods. By factories, you would like new constructors? Well, it... Is it, another word for it? I, it, it y yes, okay. essentially. Factories, constructors are similar okay. concepts. Yeah, fa factories are often... Say, for example, you need a single function, but you can't get a function without it being attached to an object because it's a classical language. And so then you have to create, you have a factory to create stuff just so that you can have access to capabilities um, or constructors. Factories that create things that have constructors. Anyway, uh, this goes into actual implementation detail of Express. But... Um, I, I mean, hopefully this looks a lot more familiar and it looks a lot easier to grok, even though you, know, you don't really know the PayPal API. And let's go look at the code. So there's, I think there was two important packages or no, oh, no, there's just one, one important file. And then maybe there's a supporting file. Yeah, there's product categories. So let's go in here just so I get rid of the magic of what this is. Uh, product categories is a big, long enumeration of product categories. And so that's that's just, I didn't want to add, add an extra four kilobytes to my program. Most people aren't gonna need those categories, so I just made it optional that if you if you need one of the four most common categories, which usually when you, you want to be broad, so you're either gonna say goods, services, or adult, and then you know, the subcategories of what type of good it is doesn't matter because the card still goes through just fine. And you don't, you, no one ever got in trouble for saying goods when they were selling goods. But if you market as clothing, but it's deemed to be a hygiene product because it's disposable clothing or something, then, you know, then, then you could get in trouble or whatever. So um, this is, this is it. So here's my initializer. So where you had about five different files containing lots of different constructors and everything. Here, here are the options that you can initialize with. You got the environment, you got a couple of options in terms of um, whether the, this, I, I won't go into what these are, but there's just, there's a couple of options that apply globally to all PayPal requests, or at least a large set of PayPal requests that you could say, all PayPal requests that I make, I want this to be applied globally to them. I noticed that variable name has two underscores in front of it. Sandbox, is, that, is there any particular reason for the underscores? Yeah, so I, I put underscores to things that are meant to be, so if you console.log this, you will see those, Yeah. right? And so my goal is, and in this case, I think the, the client secret actually does get exposed that way. Let me see, do I create? A wrapper around it or do I just attach it yeah client secret right there okay um, so it's it's pretty common if you have some sort of logging facility that you just remove things that have an underscore in front of them and it's pretty common that if you console.log something and you see an underscore it's meant to indicate hey don't depend on this feature or functionality so basically by putting the underscores what I'm saying to the reader is don't depend on this being named sandbox API base URL. If you want to monkey patch something, fine, do it. You have access to monkey patch it. 
but don't expect it to be there. Expect that this would break in the future potentially. So I'm just saying this is not part of the public API. Um, okay, so here's my here's my request object. I could have put a little more spacing in here and maybe some of that um, JS doc stuff. That would make this a little bit more readable because this really doesn't have enough spacing in it as it is. But things are pretty flat. You know, these are... I don't have these functions attached to anything. These are just helper functions. Hopefully this makes sense what it's uh, doing just by the name of it. These are things that are, these are just helper functions. Uh, shipping preferences, there we go. So I've got, basically this is just for the, for type, type linting. If you have type linting enabled in JavaScript, it's sometimes it's nice to not accidentally misspell a string. So it's common to put strings as variables with this, of the same name. Uh, just so that if if you've got autocomplete, then you can start typing it and the autocomplete will fill it out. Or if you have type linting, then it'll say, hey, there's no property dot capture on intents. Did you mean capture? Um, let's see. Here we go. So here's here's order dot capture. Boom. That's that. Here's product dot types. Here's product.create. There's the request object for it. Boom. So could, could use a little bit more white space, but I find this to be much more communicative. Bring stuff together and work on the principle of objects, not on the principle of classes and inheritance. Oh good, I did put some JS doc in a couple of these. I meant to go do this for all of them. At some point, I suppose I will. But yeah. So anyway, there's there's an example of classless JavaScript. And then everything's in one file, so if you need to, you know, grep through, well, almost everything's in one file. Oh, whoops. That uh, indentation got messed up there. Apparently tabs. But yeah, so this all the stuff I need is right here. If I need to search through it to find something, I can. And then the namespacing is that you know, I've got order, I've got product, etc. So I'm still grouping my functions together. It's still easy for tooling to inspect this. It's still easy for me to um, understand when I'm when I'm using something what what part of the process it belongs to. But it's just very flat. There's not very much nesting. The goal is simplicity. So um, I don't see any questions coming in online. Do we have any more questions in the room, thoughts, comments? How long did this take you? How long did what take me? The, like writing this? Uh, well, it took a long time because I had to, the longest part was actually figuring out how to get started at all. Once I found the first curl request, that actually was the right API, banging this out wasn't that arduous of a process because basically I'm just looking at, oh, JSON object curl, copy, paste, change for variables. Um, oh, I need to do this thing. This thing has an optional header that can be set across the board. And then I go back up here and I say, okay, well, let's make that an option that I can pass that in. But I built this out as I needed it, so I didn't just sit down and look at the PayPal docs and say, okay, I'm going to implement everything that PayPal implements. Because if I did, then this would need to be several files. Products would need to be its own file. Orders would need to be its own file, et cetera, et cetera. This just covers the basic use case of I want somebody to be able to, I want to be able to take a JSON file that represents a product category that I have or a CSV that represents a product category that I have. I want to be able to import it into PayPal and be able to match my database as well. So the ID of the PayPal product and the ID in my database are in sync so that if they get out of sync, I know, oh, I need to, I need to either re-ingest from the JSON file or re-ingest from the database and publish the new information to PayPal. And um, then I wanted to be able to capture a user's payment. And PayPal has an inevitably complex system that is not due to over-engineering or or bad design, but just due to the fact that, I mean, there is a little bit of, 
sprawl from them acquiring different companies and having different versions of their API. But the, the, the complexity and the PayPal process is predominantly because of assurances. You need to, set on your server, you need to use your secret to define some things like a product. I'm gonna sell you a t-shirt, it's an extra large, it costs $15. Uh, I need to be able to give you potentially a discount. You need to be able to get 10% off on your order. Uh, PayPal needs to know that you are logged into PayPal. PayPal needs to know that you trust this site. And then PayPal redirects in the browser. So the tokens that are in the browser are not particularly useful because otherwise the person could take the token and they could either spoof a request to the server to make it look like they successfully completed the order before they have or other things. So you do end up having to do a lot of checks. So when, once you get an order in the browser, you send it to your server and your server basically marks it as pending, but then you have to wait for a web request. You either have to go out and fetch and check, is this order actually completed? Because the browser might redirect before PayPal's database actually uh, persists and propagates the change that the order was completed. So you might get the completed ID, go fetch the completed ID and it might say pending, and so either you need to fetch it again or you have to wait about 30 seconds until their webhook service sends you a request with that ID saying that it's completed. So there's a lot of handshaking. Some of it could have been done better because they could have given you more of the IDs and hierarchy. So this customer ID with this product ID created a purchase with this ID. Um, but uh, let's see, do it. I just saw a message pop up. Did we have somebody asking a question? No, I don't know. Um, so, so sometimes they don't give you enough IDs, so you've got to store more information in your database between handshakes, whereas if they would just give you the information that you needed, then you could have everything at once when something's complete. But uh, overall, the complexity is what it needs to be because of the asynchronous nature of a card can be initially approved and then it could be declined. Uh, it could, it, or, or the, the, the capture, no, what is it? the authorization of the card could succeed and the capture of the card could fail um, and other things like that. But uh, yeah, the pay, pay, how to implement PayPal on your website is a, maybe another talk for another time. Other questions coming? How do you feel comments? about when you're using objects deconstruction? Do you think that's a useful tool? I think that it's really awesome in documentation. Uh, I've started to use it more. I think the here's here's the problem that I have with that. Yeah. Is that you do lose the obviousness of the hierarchy. So I don't think you should ever deconstruct a module. It leads to stuttering. Uh, let, let me pull up a code window so I can bang this out real quick. So let's call this x.js. Um, no? Oh, yeah, out of note. Thank you. Temp x.js. Okay, so let's do this here. Um, let's say that we've got, oops, you know, we've got person equals module.exports. And then person, um, person dot create equals, uh, you know, do some stuff. We'll just put in here our same thing that we had. We got person dot greet. Okay, and then we get person dot save. All right, so let's let's say that we have this, and this is our our person module that we created. Now, um, let's do some deconstruction. So now I'm going to say let let um, create greet save equals require. Uh, uh, we'll we'll say that I called it person.js. I didn't, but we'll say that right. This is tarted. Don't do this because now if I'm going to use tooling to inspect the code. When I go to look for, oh crap, where, where was that create at? Where, I actually need, I, I have to modify the function signature of create. I need to pass in another optional argument. Let me go find all the places where I'm using person create. Oh, 
there's literally 130 packages in my project where I've deconstructed Cree. This is really obnoxious. You can't use tooling to do a find and replace or to go find where the relevant things are. So that's really obnoxious. But then, you know, because this is what people are taught, they go one step person further. So now they do create person, greet person, save person. Now this is double tarted because you created a problem and then you solved it by creating another problem. So now, now my person, you know, person dot create person. This makes no sense. What, what is this, C++? Right? It just, this is what we call stuttering. Stuttering is when you, you know, if we were doing it in TypeScript, it'd probably be something like this, or no, no, what would it be? Is it like this? Uh, let, let P equals person create person, person, person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> something, something like that, right? So we don't want stuttering. It doesn't, it doesn't help us communicate. So this is the appropriate thing to do. And then even if it's just later down in the code, right? So let, let's say that we're down 50 lines further in the code, right? Do, 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 Okay. Now, if we have this create function all the way down here, how the heck am I supposed to know, even in one file, how the heck am I supposed to, what, wait, what was this create function for? You know, and then you start renaming things and you start doing wonky business like this, where it's, you know, create, create person, and, you know, that's confusing. And so now you want to go find a place in your code, you need to refactor something, you got 50 different names in 50 different places, and none of them make any sense. So I think destructuring can be useful. Um, you know, say we've got a function and it accepts a couple of um, options. I think this is really great for documentation, although, you know, JS doc is awesome too. But uh, we've got a name, an age, and a credit card, right? So this is our, uh, you know, this is our create function. Let's go back into our, our person. Oops. XJS? Yeah, that's, that's our person. It's called, it's called X because we're dumb. Because we don't believe people are people. We believe that they're, they're X's. You date long enough and everyone's an X. <laughs> All right, so this kind of thing, for example, I think this can be appropriate. I think this can be nice. It, it's, it's not, uh, <clears throat> the way that it's scoped, if I need to refactor the code, this is not likely going to cause me too many problems. This makes sense. It's contained and it's clear documentation and it follows the, 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 JavaScript truest principle of uh, one um, one object in, one object out. Although now that we have de destructuring, you can also write JavaScript more like Go, uh, which is kind of cool. So, for example, in Go, uh, let me let me do this. In Go, objects are values. I mean, they're not different than, I mean, errors. Errors are values. That's not different than any other language. But say, for example, you do let um, p error equals person dot get from db, let's say. Uh, Is that going to return an array with two values? No. Now I have p and I have error. So I could check, you know, if error um, return null error. You could do stuff like this. And then... So it returns two different variables. Is that what you're doing over here? Like the p equals the, the, the right p dash error equals... So this, this would be returning this would be returning an array right. that has a person object and an error object in it. Oh, okay. Yeah, so then I would be destructuring P and error from that. Now, I don't do this only because the way that promises work, errors already are values. So there's no need to do this because you can just do like this. Right? 
you know, if you need to, if you need to treat the error as a value, you can just call catch on it. And then you can say, well, you know, if we have an error getting from the database, we're just going to return um, person dot create, for example, you know, maybe we do this. So we say, you know, get or create person. And we, you know, uh, AJ. So th this is already a great pattern that we can use. Since you're doing a catch, can you also do a find layer? Is that not available in JavaScript? I think there is a finally, but I don't know what the use case is. It may be that I've just not educated myself well enough, or it may be that I've never encountered it. Because you can just call dot then. You know, I don't know what I don't know what finally would mean in JavaScript. I think it is there, but I think it just behaves kind of like a dot then but maybe doesn't return another dot then? Has anybody used finally? Not yeah. in JavaScript, no. Oh, no. Oh, cow. Like it's a ghost again. Yeah. All right. But 9 o'clock, uh, scheduled light turn off. Yep. OK. So, wait, you're not using try catch? Uh, no, try catch is a code smell. The only reason you should ever use try catch is if you're building a parser. So for example, json.parse, that makes sense for a try catch. You should never use try catch with uh, async await because you have dot catch. And so, because if you're going to write try catch, you, you just recreate the pyramid of doom all over again. You know, like, oh, I saved myself from callback hell and put myself in try catch hell. <laughs> yeah. I, I like how try catch looks. Like, I like how it feels because it's like just easier to read, I feel like. I False. It is absolutely not easier to read. I used to think that. So if you're talking about that's just what I'm used to. No, if you're talking about if you're talking about a traditional try catch, the way that a try catch would work on something like a parser. That's the primary use case for try catch is if you're trying to parse something and you have uh, an exceptional case uh, that that seems to be because because oftentimes in a parser it's better to I'm just. Using them like divs, like <laughs> no. <laughs> no. So so say say you do this, right? Catch e whoops. And a data equals null, whatever. This is okay. If this you know this this kind of thing this is okay. A try catch that's you know two, three, four lines long, that's okay. But when you have a try catch where it's like try 50 lines of my program, <laughs> catch, return. That's tarted. That's just straight up tarted. And then you got another one of those in here, you know? And it's like, oh, try, Whoa, catch. No, do not do that. You know? And then you got, you know, 50 lines of your program here. I was thinking it would be for a short transaction inside a method that's all contained in. But it just depends. Like if you're if you're doing it for this kind of thing where it's synchronous code, that makes sense. But if you're taking code that's asynchronous and then using async await and then using try catch, that doesn't make any sense. That it's not even it's not even possible. You can't you can't unwind the stack on something that happens in the future. <laughs> Which that might not make sense, but so the, the, the idea with try catch is, for example, let's do this. Let's say I try, let's say I've got var i equals zero, and then I'm going to try i plus equals one, whoops, plus equals one. So now i is equal to two, and then i plus equals one. So, or I guess, no, now it's equal to one, now it's equal to two. I catch i minus equals one, right? Um, Console.log i. Uh, so what happens if there's an error right here? What will be the value of i? Is it, well, it's going to stop right there um, before it gets to the, the last uh, i plus equals 1. So And then it's going to go into the catch, and it's going to decrement it. So you're wrong. It's going to stop here, and because it is a try, it is going to unwind the stack. 
So it's going to subtract one on its way back up. And then once it reaches the top, it's going to go down to the catch, and then it's going to decrement again. And so you're going to end up with negative one, not zero. Oh, it's a whole thing. Right, but it's, but it, because it says, cancel the transaction if this doesn't work. That's what it tries to do. Yeah. Try. But try catches in JavaScript really don't make much sense because you can't guarantee that you can unwind the stack. And I don't know if that is, I, maybe with await, maybe if you await, it can, no, it, there's no way it can unwind the stack. There's no possible way it can unwind the stack. I just, I guess I've just seen so many examples of it that I thought it was like a okay thing. So. Well, here's the thing. Most people don't program in JavaScript. They program in TypeScript or they program in React or they program in Elm or they programmed in, you know, whatever else, right? Or even back in the jQuery days. I mean, jQuery is JavaScript. It's more JavaScript than the DOM is, but it's not. Its idioms are not necessarily aligned, right? So most people don't program in JavaScript. Most people don't learn JavaScript. Most of the tutorials on JavaScript are written by people that are really good at SEO, not really good at programming. And so, yeah, almost everybody that you're going to see do it, and, and this is the argument against me. Well, if everybody does it the wrong way, doesn't that make it the right way? Sure, I guess so. But it's functionally not the way that the language is designed to work, you know? If everybody starts using, uh, if everybody in, in the nation catches a disease and they start using a knife to eat their breakfast cereal, can you call them tarted anymore when everybody in the nation is using a knife to eat their breakfast cereal? Obviously, this is not what the knife is designed for. Obviously, it can lead to bad outcomes to use the knife. <laughs> but if that's what everyone's doing, then it's kind of hard to stand on the hill and say, I have the spoon. <laughs> no one cares. They're like, you, you crazy. Per no one. People don't eat cereal with a spoon, you, you bozo. But that's, you know, that's what it is. So everything I say, you can always take it with a grain worth of salt because... Hardly anybody does the types of things that I suggest. However, you in your own personal life, this is the beauty. This is the beauty. This is the no, beauty. I'm, I'm willing to learn. I just, I just was confused because it seemed common. It's no, it is common. It's absolutely common. It's more common to do that way because most people come from class-based programming languages where stack can be unwound because they're not asynchronous. But this is what I'm saying. You can take the things that I teach you and they can apply to you as an individual and you can get joy and fulfillment and, and better code out of them. Don't expect the world to change because you can't, you can't, that's not going to happen. When you were doing that long try, mess and try catch example, I thought you were a former uh, Java programmer, actually. It really felt like Java. I hope not. Because you shouldn't write Java like that either. Try catch should be for things where you want to unwind the stack. If you wouldn't want to unwind the stack, you don't try catch. Try catch should be, as you said, Spencer, it should be just a couple of lines long. If you're doing it a cu couple of lines long and there's nothing asynchronous inside of it, you're good. But yeah, it just, it bugs the, lots of things bug the bejeebies up. If you're dealing with a library that throws errors, don't you have to try catch so your app application doesn't crash? Um, that, that came in on the comments. So, oh, and there was another comment before that I didn't see. So if, no, well, it depends. If you try catch, if it's something synchronous, if it's asynchronous, then you can use dot catch like this right here. So this bit right here, if it's a library that throws an error and the error is asynchronous, you call dot catch. If the library throws an error and the error is synchronous, then you need try catch. But generally that's, that's like I said, it's something like a parser. It's something where the stack can be unwound. And the reason that we have try catches around parsers is because when something's a parser, there's so many tokens and there's so many cases where something can go wrong. You only want to optimize for the happy path because you want it to be fast. If you check for every possible invalid condition in a parser, uh, then, and, and it's not something where it's a security concern, such as something where there's executable code embedded, such as a PDF, which is how people have rootkitted. That basically the most powerful exploits on Mac and iPhones have been from PDFs because of exactly this parsers that are written sloppy. But if you're not talking about something that's executable, if you're talking about data, there's so many different ways that something could go wrong. If you try to handle every single one of them gracefully, you'll just make your parser slow and the code won't be any better. And so it's better just to assume that the parser is going to go down the happy path 
and that the parser is going to be correct. Again, assuming you're in a memory safe language, don't ever do this in C. Uh, and then if there's an exception, then you just, you try catch it and then your code runs faster and you're optimizing, of course, for the case where 99% of the JSON files that are uploaded to your server are valid JSON files. So we don't want to optimize for the case where there might be an invalid JSON that's uploaded to the server. We want to optimize for the case where it's valid because that's what it's going to be most of the time. So anyway. Oh, and then there was another one. Um, let's see. Maybe it's just pushed everything into a stack and then pop it out when it needs to go back. I don't know what that was in reference to, but that is, that is uh, the try-catch philosophy. Yeah. We got a couple people in online as well. All right. So I, anyway, I will, I will, I'm going to say that my presentation is done. We are definitely on to other things now. So my presentation is done. I, I hope, I sincerely hope that that was useful to you and that you can, you can implement, oh, there's some, some online clapping. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> it was actually a sound effect, I think. Or maybe it was clapping. I couldn't tell. But that was a different sound. Clap. Yeah, and I wonder if it's Steve. Steve, is that you? Or oh no, it's the software. When somebody puts a clap, it makes a clap sound over here. Okay, got it. All right. Anyway, so that said, that done. Uh, now we can talk about other things, or we can go home. Oh yeah. You, you told me to make this note. What happens when ternaries go bad? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I, wrote, I wrote that down just for you. I'm already in a bad mood. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, like, the whole app is in one line of code. Oh. <laughs> it's great. Okay. Do people really miss ternaries? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and the, um, the I, order of operations is a little weird with them, too. Uh, like, it's not it's not always where I think it should be. I feel like if you don't put properties around, it's really hard to tell what it's doing. It's about, I think it's, it's what it's trying to do. It's trying to put it, put the value in a const. And it's trying to say, okay, there's no side effects here. What does that tell you? Right. It's not a const. Because if it was a <laughs> constant, it wouldn't be able to be one of multiple values. Right, but it's saying, it's saying, it's, it's trying to make uh, the intention. Obviously, as everybody knows, it's trying to make it cleaner. It's trying to, it's, and, and and because of that, there's a lot. You know, there are obviously sacrifices. <laughs> uh oh, you're gonna get canceled. No, because I've appropriated the word "tarded," <laughs> which is a well. Actually, I didn't appropriate anything. This is a new word that I made up. Tarded does not exist as a word, so I am free to claim it. It could be less tarded. Probably Doctor Who reference. <laughs> Tardis-ish, you know. Okay. So, can't wait for AJ to get banned from YouTube. It's coming soon, folks. <laughs> it's coming soon. Just let me keep talking. Everybody, <laughs> so turn that off. Year 2040 and everybody's banned. Yeah, so I, I actually can't even think of a case of, I can't come up with a contrived example for this because my brain doesn't work that way. No, you just keep tacking them on and you just put them on one line. No, 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 no. I'm talking about the const. Like so a constant, so this is how a constant should be declared, declared okay? Um, const, um, let's say e no name equals uh, e, no, name. This is a constant. That's a perfectly appropriate constant. All caps. Right. The, yeah, cons the, are yeah. all caps. Constants. Duh. Constant. I'm thinking of the constants they use when, uh, like in React. But they're not constants. This is, I, this, is, this is just the thing that bugs me. The whole world has gone a different way. I can't do anything about it other than complain in this room. But if it's a variable, not, it's not, not saying, a constant. I'm not saying it's right. I'm saying that like... Yeah, no, every, everybody does it. Everybody does it. Everybody does the React 
Re in React, everything is a const, and it's all, yeah, because because in React, it's always going through and it re it it uh, it reruns all the code, and when it does, something might change, and so when it runs it again through the const, then it's basically saying like it it changes, but it changes for that state. So it's, I think it's trying to be. So uh, Josue says hello, everybody. Hi, Josue. But so so you get stuff like this. I th is this how it is? It, it's like this, right? This, this is this is just, means three. Yeah, but but when you nest them, mm -hmm. nest. Something I don't know. Right, yeah. I think if you nest a ternary, you're kind of defeating the purpose because yeah. it's supposed to be simplistic. Yeah, so there's there's only one case in JavaScript where I use a ternary. There's exactly one, and that is if I'm writing code that I want to work in both Node and the browser. Just because this this I, it's it's it breaks a rule in that generally my rules don't have exceptions. That's part of the Zen of Python. Uh, and the practicality. Beats, although practicality beats purity, uh, special cases aren't special enough to, to let me bring up Zen of Python real quick. Let me, okay, Zen of Python poster. Uh, Zen of Python poster, here we go. This is the correct one. All right. Special cases aren't special enough to break the rules, although practicality beats purity. So this is a case of practicality beats purity. This is a special case, but um, undefined. This is using several JavaScript hacky do's that I wouldn't use in any other way. Um, uh, let's see, window module dot exports. This right here. So if I wanted my person to work both in, in in Node and in the browser, well, let me put this in another file, actually. This is how I would do it. This is the simplest way, and this almost will work everywhere. And by almost will work everywhere, I mean things like Webpack, they want you to do it in the most complicated, convoluted way possible. But this right here is literally will work almost everywhere uh, with a few exceptions where it defines module. You can't do window. You have to do the test on module, not on window, because window will exist in node if it's electron, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Module will exist if it's certain types of webpack type things, but that's okay because then it will know to um, set the exports anyway. So, so this exact pattern will work with almost every bundle. And then your script can be used as a script tag if you don't run it through the bundler. Um, but this this is the ternary operator that I accept in my heart. And then we could do our person.create. And then if I put this in a browser, I'd be able to use it. If it, So let's say I want to use this in a browser. Then I can do let person equals window dot person. If I'm ever doing something in the global scope, I always use var. Don't ever use let or const in the global scope. In fact, sometimes I say just don't bother using let or const at all because there isn't any problem that they solve. There's only problems that didn't exist before that they introduce. I would back to, I would back to var. Var is simpler. Var has a very simple set of rules. It has, what, two rules and one exception. The rule of var is, var is always scoped to the function, full stop, one rule, except when it is used inside of a try catch. Because if it's used inside of a try and the try does not complete, the var will be undeclared. Are you ever worried about hoisting? Well, I'm sorry, I'm getting off on that. Well, that's the thing. That's the one rule. You don't have to worry about hoisting. People invented the word hoisting to make var sound complicated. Var is scoped to a function, right. full stop, period. If you remember that one rule, you don't have to worry about what hoisting is or why it works or why it doesn't work. You don't have to know anything about hoisting. 
because that one rule encompasses everything that hoisting is. Vars are scoped to the function, full stop, period. That's it. Now, if you want to do let, so there's a couple of... Oh. I'm sorry, I'm getting off the topic of... It's okay, I am a divergent thinker. I can't complete a thought to save my life. <laughs> if you're using let, then when you do cases, your cases have to look like this. And this is really weird, but I do use let now, and so I do write my cases like this, because if you don't write your cases like this, then your code will break. But this is unusual, because basically what they did is they didn't scope let to certain other... So there's certain implicit scopes in JavaScript where there isn't a curly brace, and switch case is one of them. And so it creates what I think the proper name for it is the temporal dead zone. And so if you use let inside of a switch, let is both defined and undefined. It's Schrodinger's let. That's what we should call this. <laughs> sure. Yes, because literally, if you're, if you're asking if the variable exists, then it does. But if you haven't assigned it, then it doesn't. So the variable can give you both errors. It can give you both not defined and already defined. And I don't know how to spell Schrodinger, but Schrodinger's let right here. If you get rid of these blocks right here, then if you go into case two, you have an error because let is defined in case one, even though let never executes in case one. So in this case, you either have to go back to var or, so yeah. And then const, const, if you declare const in the global scope, and then something else declares const of the same name in the global scope, then you have an error. So if you just willy nilly your const, then, you know, or, and the same thing with let actually. Um, but with const, there's, it's diff more difficult to work around it. Anyway, so this is, this is the thing that I was intending to show was just, in the browser, this thing gets required this way. And then in Node, in Node I tend to use let more, and browsers I tend to use var more because browsers are more you know, particular. Um, you can do this, and you can say require uh, you know, person.js, for example. By the way, I also always recommend that you actually use the file name. Because if you do this, it becomes ambiguous, and inevitably you will run into a place where you have a folder name person with an index.js inside and a person.js, and then and perhaps a person.json, and it will be magic as to which one loads and why, and then you'll go edit a file, and then it won't be the right file to edit, and then you'll be scratching your head, and then four hours later, you realize, oh, there's also a folder name person with an index.js inside. But if you do this, or this, you never have that problem. So I am all about learning. Every time I encounter a problem in coding, I think, how could I have written my code in a way that this problem would never occur again in the future? And that is what my entire philosophy on coding is based on, is how to write correct programs without errors. Uh, and then if you need to write a module that can be used by the browser or um, in Node, then... Oh, somebody's speaking. What'd you say? Oh. Who's the ghost again? Yeah, it's the ghost again. Now you can use the double uh, question marks. So let's, let's say that I have another bit of code where I'm doing the same thing. So I've created one module like this, and I want it to be able to be used in script tag. I want it to be able to be used in webpack. I want it to be able to be used everywhere. And then... I've got another place where I'm depending on that same code and I also want that code to work everywhere, then this is what you do. You do the same thing and then you check to see if there's exports.person, meaning window.person, or you do require dot slash person. And so this is how I write code that works in Node, works in browsers, works in Webpack, works uh, if you concatenate the files together with a traditional old school 1990s style bundler.
And uh, to answer the question that we started this with that I got off track four times with. Ternary. Ternary. So already this thing, yeah. This is another reason that I don't like const is because people try to abuse const. They don't think, oh, wait, I can't assign this to a constant because it's a variable. They think, oh, how can I write my code in the most confusing way possible so that I can still use const even though this is a variable? So that, that's one thing with the ternaries is you end up with stuff like this. And I have literally seen code like this. There is actually a lot of code like this in the code base at work. Um, because one of my coworkers, he likes things to be terse because he optimizes primarily for writing because he's used to writing the code by himself. And when you're used to writing the code by yourself and you can hold everything in your head, then this seems like a reasonable way to write it. But as soon as you have to share with two or three people, then this is no longer a reasonable way to write it. And people do other things. They, they'll put them on separate lines. I think Prettier will format this for you so that it indents it to know. Um, uh, it, it'll do something like this one belongs to this one, but then this one belongs to this one or something like that. I think Prettier will do this formatting wow. for you. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, here, here's the other dangerous thing with the, the or operator. So we have let x equal, was it yo? Oh, yeah, yeah. This one came up today. This one, I actually found a bug in our code today. So let title equal, um, equal uh, name of thing, right? So let's say we got this. Or, or, um, default name plus uh, is great. What is that supposed to do? If the name of thing is null or undefined, it's supposed to put this, give you the string which is concatenated. But will it put name of thing with is great either way? But will it, will it, it take off is great? So the question is, what are we getting? Are we going to get? Oh no! Oh, because the order of operation. Oh yeah. Because it's gonna. What it's gonna do? Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, what is intended here? Did we want a prefix, or did we want? Which, which is the behavior that we're, you can't tell from reading this. And Unless anything, your brain is a JavaScript parser, but mine actually isn't, even after 15 years. Anything that expects people to know in their head order of operations, especially if they've used multiple languages, because they aren't the same in every language, yeah. I would generally consider being an anti-pattern. Oh, we have a C guy in the chat. Mm. I'm sorry, my friend. I probably shouldn't tell people I'm sorry that they're C programmers. <laughs> oh. No, C is, oh, it's Hosue. Oh, okay. Hosue is in on Jitsi. Oh, okay, interesting. Oh, because Jitsi is a little bit more real time than the YouTube, huh? You, you have only a second of lag instead of 15 seconds. Ah, hmm. I have to think about that for the, the nightly stuff. I, I don't know. I can't make it too complicated because I, I do live streams. Uh, almost every day. What do we want to talk about next month? I have a, I have something up as a, um, what's the word? A default, de facto, if we don't get another presenter. But um, what, does anybody want to present next month? You got anything you learned about recently? You got anything that you want to share with people? Um, I'll only heckle you a little bit. I do practice restraint. I did have to get on Christian's case because he showed people that using ternary operators is more efficient or some nonsense like that. And I, I had to, I had to speak my piece. I think that was great. Nobody was sleeping when we had that exchange. Nobody was on their phone. Everybody was focused. All right. So Getting views. Yeah. Drama gets views. That's just, if, yeah. it, leads, if it leads, it leads. Yeah, I'm supposed to be cleaning throw up off my carpet at home, but well, thank you for sharing that. Daughter <laughs> <laughs> throw up. Oh, yeah. Ask but but seriously, uh, next month. So my de facto topic that I'm going to go to if we don't have something else, um, 
is I'm going to do the Go proverbs applied to JavaScript just like I did the Zen of Python. And all this stuff is on the Utah Node um, YouTube channel. So if you have not watched Creeds of Craftsmanship Part 1, uh, the Zen of Python, then just Google Creeds of Craftsmanship Zen of Python, and that will take you to either the unedited one is on the Utah Node channel and the edited one that's only slightly edited, just a couple things removed at the beginning and the end, and uh, the volume level adjusted because the, the mic was over oversaturated um, that particular day. But anyway, I advise watching that. And the Go Proverbs are pretty similar to that, but I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go over Go Proverbs and how they can be applied to JavaScript. I think that Go and JavaScript are very well paired languages and uh, and the, and the same types of principles you use in coding Go, you can use coding JavaScript. And another one I've got upcoming is actually a watch party where we just watch some uh, Crockford talks because Crockford, in my mind, he is the JavaScript dude. He's, 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 he's the one to watch. So I got a watch party. I got a couple things on the meetup, but what do, what do you all think? That was a lot better than the idea, the idea I had for a presentation. What idea do you have for a presentation? Oh, that sounds terrible. <laughs> <laughs> talking? I told you. Dang it. Go on. I was thinking about talking about uh, uh, array methods, but I think those are those ideas you had better, particularly because that cross one. Let's go with array methods. Let me push back the um, the go one. Let's do array methods. I think you'll do a good job on that. And There's only like two or three, so like it's a matter of content. Filter, map, reduce. If you get those three, that's most of it. Includes, uh, find, I feel reverse, like a million of them. Like, reverse, I, I think that they, I think you could get, I, I don't think you should cover all 30 of them. No. But, um, I was only thinking those three, but I mentioned uh, reverse, like sort. Right? They're just like, array like this. And, yeah. No, I, 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 I think there's, you, push pop. So from what I understand, in Go, it's just... Slice, splice. It's just like the one way to iterate over an array, right? It's just like Go is so, so beautiful. People complain that it's not functional. It's not, yeah, because it's just so simple that it, there's only one way to do it, right? Like it's just the four. Yeah, and then people complain that you have to copy and paste. But one of the Go proverbs is a little copying is better than a little dependency. They designed the language to be hard to do generics on purpose. Because look at what happened to JavaScript. Generics basically means dynamic typing, essentially. Right. If, if you're talking about a compiled languages, generics is the equivalent of dynamic typing. And what it leads to is a bunch of crap, low quality, useless libraries like Lodash. Now, no, Lodash I just, is- I was seriously gonna say Lodash, because like, that's exactly what it is. Lodash is incredibly high quality in terms of the value that's gone into it over the years, yeah. but it's completely useless because Lodash was, it, it was fighting an uphill battle and it won. Everything was already on the standards track for JavaScript, but that dude was relentless in terms of promoting. Can you tree shake Lodash? I think you can, right? D tree shaking is a myth. Anytime you hear somebody say tree shaking, assume that they're lying. Yes, it can work in certain bundlers, but the tree shaking that you get by default, if you're talking about Node, is the garbage collector. If it's not being used, it gets garbage collected. And the tree shaking in the bundlers is 90% theoretical, probably more than that. So every bundler will say, blah, 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 tree shaking. But if you read the fine print, it says, we haven't implemented tree shaking. We have no idea how to do it. Maybe it'll be available in version 10. But Lodash is an example of one where it's lots of functions that already exist in the language. And yes, under certain use cases, which he's done really good at this. He finds benchmarks that show that Lodash is faster than native code for some weird edge case, and then he'll promote Lodash is faster. That's how he got Lodash to overtake underscore, was that he just promoted the bejeebies out of every little edge case in which he was able to tweak something in some stupid way to make it run faster on V8, right? And then he also responded to literally every single outstanding yeah. issue on the underscore yeah. git. He went through hundreds of issues and answered every single person's question. On and I'm sure he did the, the same thing on, uh, on, on the, the low dash guy did it on the underscore repository. And I'm sure he did the same thing on Stack Overflow. I would imagine that he's been on literally probably 
in the level of thousands of Stack Overflow posts, editing posts to use Lodash instead of underscore, and answering questions about Lodash with, or about underscore with, here's how to do with Lodash. It sounds like if you were the maintainers of underscore, you would be, you'd feel easier to answer questions. Well, the thing is, he tried to work with the, the other guy at first, but he was a little bit forceful, and he wanted a breaking change for something like negative zero. Did you know there's a negative zero? No. Yeah, they're positive and negative zero, and sometimes they're equal, and sometimes they aren't. <laughs> is this like... The more I learn about JavaScript. Zero? <laughs> well, this isn't JavaScript. This is IEEE floating point math. IEEE floating point math defines both positive and negative zero. Because it's bi is it binary thing? No, it's it's just a weird. It's base. Essentially, it's either a theoretical mathematics thing, because I think you know you have positive infinity, negative infinity. You have positive zero, um, negative I, zero. I, I think it has something to do with when you know, like your precision gets so low, you can effectively get to zero, but you may not want to lose a sign of what you have. Ah, I think that's what yeah, I, I read. I've, I've dealt with that one. Yeah. When I'm, so let's do this. Let's say, um, let's just put a bunch of zeros in here. Let's let's try this. So let x equals um, 0, x minus equals, uh, so, I don't know. That e36, is that how many zeros? Dang it, I used let, that I should use y. The times 10 to the negative 36. Oh, okay. It's an exponential. Yeah, that makes sense. I should have used oh, far. Yeah, it's don't ever use. But I, okay, so I don't know. I don't know how you do it, but you can get negative zero. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> there it is. I found negative zero, everyone. I found it. <laughs> Why is this? I don't know. But it, but anyway, that that was one of the. I, if I recall correctly, that was one of the sticking points of contention. Was that he wanted he wanted some really pedantic crap like this. Where though it would have it, it broke the way that um, that that underscore worked for some small percentage of users in the name of absolute correctness because I what is let's see is this that's so true because once you print it out that way and then it's like and then you break that and then people are like why the crap is our million dollar stock I don't know why you would run math stuff off of JavaScript. Yeah, um, I love Go. Uh, it's like a way to introduce Python people to C. Claps to Crockford. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know that we need to introduce Python people to C. They're already using C because what library in Python isn't written in C? But I think that Go is a good way to introduce Python people to modern programming. And C people to modern programming. I troll my own fan base. This is why I'm not very popular. <laughs> I do feel like your story about Lodash here uh, resonated with the comment you made that JavaScript tutorials are all about SEO, which when you said that also suddenly made me realize that that's why W3 schools exist. Because somehow they end up being like the first search response. And you're like, well, MDN's right below it, but MDN's like accurate. Well, no, 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 no. In, in my mind, MDN and W3 schools have switched places. Okay. I think W3 schools is a better resource now, and MDN is a worse resource now. No. Yes, because on MDN, they give the most obtuse examples, yes. and, they, and, and they give you bad code. Whereas W3 schools is, here's something that you might actually want to do with an array. Here's some values that make sense in the array. And here's the three methods that you might use if you were actually trying to do this. Whereas MDN is, here's the most obscure thing that you could ever do with an array. And here's an example that no one can understand because it's about obscure things that no JavaScript developer would ever need to do. I remember when I was learning how to program, I would always go to W3, because I start off with JavaScript. Yeah. W, and W3 just, it, it was simple and it made sense, 
and had really digestible examples. You could just look at it. I know what that does. Well, they used to be really bad. The examples used to be really bad, but they got a lot better because they got so much flack. There was an entire campaign to get MDN to rank number one. And, and it worked. And MDN became the first result. And W3 schools learned from that. And they said, oh, people want us to not show them JavaScript version 1.0 of how to use an object instead of an array. People want to learn how to use the current ECMAScript 3 and ECMAScript 5 JavaScript. Let's update our examples. And so they went and they updated hundreds, if not thousands of examples, and they put relevant, useful code from a modern version of JavaScript. Because basically what they were doing is they were let, resting on their laurels. They put a bunch of effort in 10 years before, there were no competitors, and their examples were crap because that's how you had to do it 10 years prior. Yeah. And admittedly, I, I, your story here is believable because probably for at least six years, I automatically skip over any link that says W3 school says, I've already biased the fact that they, they have bad information. Yeah, we'll give which, them a try. Maybe to... even now. All right, y'all people online. Um, oh, agreed. I was noticing I've been getting better results from W3 schools. Uh, that's why they're the ones who are going to report you for Tarded. <laughs> oh. All right, we all have a good one. Uh, those of you that are online, we're out. Peace. I'm out of I'm out of complaints for the evening. <laughs> I somehow doubt that. <laughs>